Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the five minute chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now this was an unusual trading day in that the US markets were not open and you can see from the volume uh, the normal 10 o'clock spike in volume uh, 8 to 10 o'clock that's when the COMEX opens and uh, you can see I have marked that out here and here you can see we didn't have that so what the trading was I don't know if it was uh, Globex or uh, Asian trading uh, it's not really clear what these volume figures come from but you can see that the patterns very clear that as New York opens and the financial reports are given uh, the price of silver is smacked down you had a significant sell-off here and uh, again you had a big sell-off on the Bernanke speech day with a subsequent rally but uh, if you look at today you can see that the price broke to the upside here and then we had a significant rally into past the $32 level actually touched as high as 32.30 and then fell off and you can see we touch it again and now fell off and we're rallying so we may actually break higher overnight in the Asian market and then we'll wait and see what happens on the uh, New York open but it's very clear the pattern is clear that the rises in silver the, the uh, slow rises or uh, some of the spike rises they happen on low volume and that's consistent with my view that the markets are manipulated that the very large volume moves have to do with paper short sellers on the COMEX and that when the markets left to its own to seek its own equilibrium prices just naturally rise because of course the price of silver is so ridiculously low compared to other assets in the world and we're going to look at that later uh, so a very significant move on very little volume if we pull out to the daily you can see as I point out on my blog this 3750 level is really you can see most of our congestion and resistance we've passed through a significant portion of that if we draw a line back that matches the current price we're going to be right about here and with that you can see that a significant portion of the trading uh, is below this line now there is still these spike top areas here but uh, you can see that we ran very quickly to them so I expect that we could run very quickly into these areas and then of course that leaves this 3750 price that's going to be our next big resistance level and uh, it's my guesstimate and that's just my guesstimate that uh, the price is going to try to test that real quick and like I said in previous videos we could see moves to 32, 34, and 36 very rapidly. Now that doesn't mean we can't have a significant sell-off because again this is just a paper price but uh, as we'll see when we look at some of the coins ultimately the paper price is going to be tied in some way to the physical price. So let's go over and look at the questions of the day. The first one here is from the Muzzman and this is about copper rounds free Lakota Bank brother John so I purchased from preciousmetalhouse.com from time to time and I noticed today that they have some copper rounds in their new items section I did not know that copper rounds were available I wanted to know number one if you had any thoughts about stacking copper rounds at these prices two if you had any thoughts on this bank free Lakota Bank supposedly they're not operating on a fractional reserve banking system etc they also deal in other bullion products last but not least I noticed the new 2013 lunar series and 2013 
Kookaburra series are available online and wanted to see if you had any thoughts about being ahead of the curve and locking in at these prices. I don't know why the Kooks and Lunar series always seem to warrant higher premiums down the line, just an observation I made. As always, and without spending too much time, thanks for everything you do. The Silver Community would be a huge loss without you. So a number of questions in this question. First of all, the copper rounds. Well, I don't really pay too much attention to copper. I do have a lot of pennies. I've had them for all the way since the 70s. I've collected them since I was a kid. And, uh, of course, the pre-1982 pennies are going to be copper, uh, and the ones after are going to be zinc. But if you just look at the fundamentals for copper, there's really not a comparison to silver. Copper is just such a common element compared to silver and gold. There's really uh, just not a reason to spend your money on copper unless it's just something you're doing as a hobby. Uh, it's it's Yes, it is the third metal that's used as money for the penny and the pence, and uh, but really the fundamentals for copper are nothing like the fundamentals for silver. The fundamentals for silver are so ridiculously skewed uh, towards the upside compared to any other metal that uh, it's it's just not worth your effort. And I've looked at a lot of things uh, looking at the South African situation that's happening right now. I've seriously looked at in my uh, Forex account, uh, I've looked at uh, shorting the South African Rand and going long. Uh, say the Japanese yen, so the yen rand cross. I've looked at a lot of other crosses uh, shorting the rand, and there's a lot of other things I look at, and whether it's stocks or uh, many other investments. But every time I do that, I I always come around to the idea that uh, I just can't beat the undervalued situation there is in silver. So no matter how compelling these other ideas seem to be. I still can't get around the fact that silver is so undervalued that uh, an investment in silver, physical silver, is always a better investment than any other investment I can find. Now, the next question is uh, the Free Lakota Bank and uh, their fractional reserve. They're not on a fractional reserve system. This is an Indian reservation, so you have to be very careful. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on on Indian reservations. The latest thing has been the gambling, but of course there's a very strong mob element and you're really uh, on very shaky ground if you involve yourself with uh, the things that go on on the Indian reservations. Uh, it would be wonderful if the Indians were sovereigns over their own land and their own reservations, but I think you're probably kidding yourself if you think that uh, they have control of their situation. Now the next point is the about the lunar series and the new um, Perth Mint products. I'm going to talk about that in a bit but first I wanted to go to the next question and that's about this latest article about China and Germany. Hi BJF, uh, this is from High and Wired, uh, China and Germany to settle in Yuan. I don't know if you saw this story, but China and Germany are supposed to start to settle trade in Yuan. Uh, and there's a Reuters article. What a blow to the dollar and another nail in the coffin. And it links this Reuters article, which surprisingly has no comments and is very brief. It says, August 30th, Reuters, Germany and China plan to conduct an increasing amount of their trade in euros and yuan. The two nations said in a joint statement after talks between Chancellor Angela Mer Merkel and Chinese Premier Wen Xiaobo in Beijing on Thursday, quote, both sides intend to support financial institutions and companies of both countries in the use of the renminbi and euro in bilateral trade and investments said the text of the statement. It also said that both parties welcomed investments in China's interbank bond market by German banks and supported the settlement of business in the yuan by German and Chinese banks and the issuance of yuan-denominated financial products in Germany. So 
this is something that I've seen coming for a while. I think that uh, the news stories coming out of the West, you have to remember how Western bias the press and information that you see is. Uh, the, you have news talking about the UN, NATO. Well, these are essentially U.S. organizations, although they purport to be international organizations. They purport to be representatives of all nations, but they're really, in fact, just U.S. organizations. And as the U.S. begins to decline in influence, then these organizations will also begin to decline in their influence. And uh, they will begin to be seen as what they really are, which are just U.S. front groups which promote U.S. interests, and they're not really world organizations at all. So it's not surprising when these bilateral agreements start to come, and they're starting to come fast and furious as the U.S. is beginning to be cut out of world trade, and the petrodollar is beginning to be undermined. Now, that brings us real quick to the Leap 2020 the latest one is all the way back in June, so there's going to be a new one. Uh, the last Leap 2020 was number 66, and uh, this one is about the September-October time frame of this year when the trumpets of Jericho ring out seven times for the world before the crisis. Now, the reason I've I pointed out before the reason why I cover Leap 2020 is because they're a Euro-based think tank and they try to uh, filter out the U.S.-based propaganda and it's very difficult to escape from U.S.-based propaganda because the United States dominates the world news uh, headlines and even U.S. organizations, news organizations, uh, which purport to be international but really aren't, are just U.S. organizations. So the uh, LEAP 2020, the GEAB, is kind of a Euro-based view, and uh, that's something I like to follow, so let's read a little bit. The progression of world events unfolds in accordance with the anticipations mapped out by LEAP E 2020 during these last few quarters. Euroland has finally come out of its political torpor and short-termism since Francois Hollande's election, number one, as France's president and the Greeks have just confirmed their willingness to resolve their problems within Euroland. Two, thus contradicting all Anglo-Saxon media and Eurosceptics forecasts, from now on, Euroland, in fact, the EU minus the United Kingdom, will therefore be able to move forward and create a true project of political integration, economic efficiency, and democratization over the 2012-2016 period, as LEAP E2020 anticipated last February in uh, GA, GEAB number 62. It's positive news, but for the coming six-month period, this, quote, second renaissance of the European project will really be the only good news at world level. All the other components of the global situation are in fact pointed in a negative, even catastrophic direction. Here again, the main media are starting to echo a long-standing situation anticipated by our team for the summer of 2012. Indeed, in one form or another, more often on the inside pages than in big headlines, monopolized for months by Greece and the Euro, one finds the following 13 topics. Number one, global recession. Number two, growing insolvency of the Western banking and financial system and henceforth partially recognized as such. Number three, growing frailty of key financial assets such as sovereign debts, real estate, and CDS underpinning the world's major banks, balance sheets, fall off of international trade, geopolitical tensions, lasting global geopolitically, geopolitical blockage at the UN, Rap rapid collapse of the whole of the Western asset-backed retirement system, growing political divisions within the world's monolithic powers, U.S., China, and Russia, lack of miracle solutions as in 2008-2009 because of growing impotence of many of the we major Western banks, the Fed, the BOE, the BOJ, and states' indebtedness, credibility and freefall for all countries having to assume the double load of public and excessive private debt, inability to control slow down the advance of mass and long-term unemployment 
failure of monetarist and financial stimulus policies such as pure austerity policies and finally quasi systemic ineffectiveness henceforth of the alternative or recent international closed groups the g20 g8 rio 20 wto on all key topics of what is no longer in fact a world agenda absent any consensus economy finances environment and conflict resolution the fight against poverty so that's the view from leap 2020 i think it's consistent with the news coming out uh, with China, uh, China really is in the position right now to do a sort of checkmate on the euro dollar. Uh, I'm sorry, on the petrodollar. And as I pointed out in the uh, piece I did on Africa, China is already putting uh, the pieces in place to uh, prepare for extraction of the. Uh, the natural resources from Africa. It looks like they're beginning to prepare the way for a uh, financial and monetary system uh, with Europe that excludes the U.S. that may be related to the tying of the Swiss franc to the euro and it's possible that the U.S. will just simply be cut out. If that's the case that could end up being disastrous for the dollar and uh, that very well could be the case. So let's go back to the questions. And the other question was about the coins that uh, are coming out from the Perth Mint. And I wanted to cover that real quick. Uh, that's the next question here. What is your opinion? This is from silver2012.com what's your opinion on these beauties now uh, we've got the year of the snake that's the new lunar series we've also got the new kookaburra and so let's go and look at the kookaburra first this is your 2013 one ounce kookaburra and you can see we're at 3828 so we're talking about a where are we at with silver 3210 so we're talking about a six dollar plus premium on this coin so that is a big premium for a new issue uh, haven't seen that in a while there's about two thousand in stock and when we look at the coin uh, I'm just gonna go with first impression my first impression is it's just really kind of cartoonish for me. Uh, it just seems kind of like a step backwards as far as the recent Perth Kookaburra uh, artistic depictions that I've seen. To me, this one, I may, it may grow on me, but to me, this one is kind of a step backwards. With a price of 38.16, I would definitely have to say that is a big thumbs down on that coin. Uh, I can't see paying a six dollar premium on that coin uh, now I did see on the snake series so I want to check it on the kookaburras uh, they did have the half ounce at a more reasonable price uh, but I don't see a half ounce here so we'll have to wait and see on that one you can go down and look at the 2012 is all the way up at 46 the 2011 is at fifty dollars so there's really not a good buy there on the kookaburras and I cannot recommend uh, the newest one. So let's go over and look at the snake series and this is the year of the snake 2013 and uh, the one ounce is 4127 which is this is the first time I've seen a coin from the Perth Mint, a Lunar Series coin from the Perth Mint, come out with nearly a $10 premium right out of the gate. Now, there's only 129 here. I don't know why that number is so low, but uh, there may be an explanation for that. I haven't had the time to check Gainesville or Provident or all the others. I did notice here, though, that the half ounce is around 2309 so that's going to give you about 46 so still that's a pretty high price and there's about 
1150 of those so I would have to say that uh, I would have to say that uh, those two premiums are just too high for me um, I usually like to see a two to three dollar premium especially in a coin that's just coming out of the gate and uh, to see a six or ten dollar premium on a coin that is very discouraging now it's encouraging in the sense that uh, the Perth Mint thinks they can get that amount of money for physical silver so that's an indication of how tight the Perth Mint is projecting the physical price to get but I certainly can't recommend uh, those coins at those prices so back to the silver chart the last thing I wanted to cover is uh, article on global wealth and as we've seen with some of the stories that have come out recently the latest story that uh, was really important came out on silver doctors was a story about Scotia Makata now if you remember uh, back in 2010 uh, Harvey Organ and his son and uh, Andrew McGuire uh, came on to um, King World News talking about uh, inspecting the vault at Scotia Makata and uh, how very very little silver there was there now recently Silver Doctors has reported that they are trying to purchase silver for a large client and they were very uh, given a very discouraging uh, reaction from Scotia Makata regarding delivery of physical silver so it seems that the story is still going that uh, it's not encouraged for people to take delivery of physical silver now there have been a lot of rumors swirling about that uh, you can go on the internet and find rumors about people getting phone calls who were interested in taking delivery of bars from off the comics and uh, very other various other uh, discouraging rules or kind of uh, uh, back of the matchbook uh, strange things that the uh, exchanges have done to discourage you uh, people who want to take delivery of physical silver from doing so it's very difficult with the mini uh, bars the uh, partial contracts that are delivered on the comics the mini contracts people have t tried to take delivery of those they make it very difficult to do so it's very difficult to take delivery of physical silver in a lot of forms and that's not surprising because in my opinion there really isn't that much out there so I wanted to do an estimate of what I would project uh, the price of silver is going to be if we get kind of a pure market or a free market once all the dust clears and I want to start with the article about global wealth this is just one that comes from uh, Credit Suisse and uh, there's any number of them you can choose this one is from 2011 so it's not that old but it's an assessment of global wealth and you can see here they did a big study of everything uh, but the bottom line is since last year's inaugural report global wealth has increased to US 231 trillion dollars from US dollar 195 trillion dollars that's a that's a big increase actually that is uh, a 10 percent increase would be it's more than a 10 percent increase so uh, if that's an indication of the growth of the money supply then obviously the money supply is still growing rapidly but so if global wealth is roughly 231 trillion dollars uh, my estimate for silver and gold I'm gonna leave out gold because it's probably a lot larger but as a conservative estimate I would say that if silver is even partially remonetized then it would not be an overly optimistic view that silver should take up at least one percent of this uh, now it might not take up that much 
So we'll be conservative and say that uh, if the silver story came out and the inflation really began to roar and people began to distrust paper assets, started to purchase physical silver and physical gold, then it would be perfectly reasonable for, let's say, $1 trillion, in other words, one half of 1% of this money to go into silver. That, in my opinion, is actually a very conservative estimate. If you look at history, uh, in previous times in history, as much as 10 or even 20% of the value of all things has been in silver. So we'll just do a half a percent and we'll say one trillion dollars. If we divide the amount of silver, and I'm going to estimate that the amount of deliverable silver, so this is presupposing that uh, the market corrects itself and paper silver is discredited and uh, physical silver becomes the really true investment for people who are seeking investment in silver, then I'm going to use an estimate of 2 billion ounces of deliverable silver. My guess is it's actually a lot lower than that because I think that the SLV and many other of these vehicles actually don't have any silver or are being drained very quickly. But if we go with this figure of 2 billion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, 2 billion ounces of silver and one trillion dollars that gives you five hundred dollar an ounce silver now I think that's very conservative um, it's not at all unreasonable to think that one half of one percent of the world's wealth should be in silver and if it happens that uh, the investors decide and come to the conclusion that these paper silver vehicles really aren't silver, then they could actually take their money and invest in real silver and a investment of just one trillion dollars in the two billion, in my estimate, outstanding ounces of silver would result in a $500 an ounce silver price. So I think that's actually a reasonable estimate for the price of silver. I think that's where we're going probably not in the short term, but in the long term. Uh, the first thing we need to do is get through that 50 price. I think we're actually going to get to this 37.50 price a lot faster than a lot of people think, uh, probably in some sort of fashion like this. But uh, that's just my projection. A lot of people have said that uh, I've been wrong many times in the past, so uh, we'll see if that's the case, if we get a smackdown. But I, I'm projecting at this point that we probably won't get a major smackdown until we get to this 3750 test. And then we'll backfill and make some predictions at that point. And we'll talk to you next time.